All right, good morning, guys. We'll uh, now just do a sort of quick overview of, of aortic um, stenosis. Let's see if this works. So we'll quickly go through some of the um, basics of etiology and epidemiology, some of the pathophysiologic features, clinically what we look for and, and how we treat them. So aortic stenosis um, is, is defined as the following. A normal aortic valve is three to four centimeters squared, but a patient typically won't understand that or conceptualize that. So what, what I like to tell them, because particularly they're, they're generally older patients, so they remember the time of a 50 cent piece. So you tell them it's about the size, of, a normal valve is about the size of a 50 cent uh, piece, but your valve, say if it's less than one centimeter squared, you can show them like the end of your pen and say, but your valve is only opening up this much. And then they sort of get it, and then they are, they'll buy into some sort of intervention, whatever you're proposing as far as treating them. So aortic stenosis is considered severe when the valve area is less than one centimeter squared and critical when less than 0 0.6. The hemodynamics of severe AS include a mean gradient of greater than 40. On physical exam, which we uh, still do, and can actually still be very helpful. I mean, if someone has a really classic loud aortic stenosis murmur, but they come back from the echo lab with a mean gradient of 20, um, sometimes, and, and I think rightly so, you might question that echo finding and have them go back and say, maybe you missed, missed the Doppler angle because this guy clearly you know, sounds like he has severe AS and, and not infrequently, it, it will turn out to be worse than was perceived. So the, the three um, findings are the slow rate of rise of the carotid pulse, the mid to late peak intensity of the murmur, and the reduced intensity of S2. And that can be seen here, and you guys will, will uh, particularly first years, will get more and more exposure uh, to these hemodynamics, but the, and understand how the hemodynamics translate to echo findings. But here is a uh, example of an aortic uh, stenosis hemodynamics. So this is the left ventricular pressure. This is the aortic pressure. Just um, this is your EKG, so you know you're in systole here. And uh, this is a phonogram uh, allow, uh, displaying how the murmur is sort of mid to late peaking in um, systole. Compare that, or it would be important to distinguish that from other systolic murmurs like mitral regurgitation or, in this case, um, some sort of outflow tract obstruction. With outflow tract obstruction, you get more of a holosystolic murmur, peaks a little earlier, and just remember the distinguishing feature. Once, you, once you're convinced it's a holosystolic murmur and you want to know if it's MR or, a, or hokum, is to have them Valsalva, and the hokum will get uh, louder um, during Valsalva, whereas MR will not. Etiology is either um, congenital, uh, rarely unicuspids or bicuspids or even quadricuspids. Um, calcific disease is, is the common disease we see particularly in the elderly population, and then still not infrequently we see some uh, rheumatic disease. So this cartoon and these pathophysiologic uh, uh, slides illustrate that. So here's a normal valve um, during, uh, closed during diastole, obviously open during systole. Here's uh, how rheumatic disease works. It's, again, similar to mitral disease. It's, it's fusion of the commissures and, and degeneration of the mitral leaflets and has issues during both uh, diastole and systole, so you get AS and AR. Calcific disease shown down here and in these two um, illustrations with the buildup of, of essentially plaque on the aortic side of the uh, valve, the ventricular side actually stays relatively well preserved in, in all these diseases. And then bicuspids, which is the common disease finding we see in uh, the younger population. Almost 40% of people have turned out they have um, bicuspid disease in those who are under uh, 60 years old. The pathology is interesting because it's similar to atherosclerosis in that uh, on the aortic side, you get disruption of the endothelium and basement membrane, and you get infiltration of inflammatory cells, macrophages, T cells, lipids, and then displacement of the elastic lamina and, and mineralization and stiffening of the valve. Again, the ventricular side remains intact. And this is um, important, not just so we understand it, um, but potentially thinking of mechanisms to treat aortic stenosis. And you might think, why not give a statin? You know, if the disease here is similar to atherosclerosis, where you have um, lipids and inflammation, could a statin work? Well, 
that was done. Uh, that's the C's trial, which was uh, simvastatin, azitamibe, aortic, and aortic stenosis, C's. And so it was uh, Zetia and uh, simvastatin, which used to be called Vitorin. I don't think that's around anymore. But, um, and what you can appreciate is that the LDL of these, these were patients with either aortic sclerosis or mi mild aortic stenosis, so sort of an early intervention to try to prevent the progression of disease. And what you can see is their LDLs came down nicely. Um, their baseline was around 130, and during treatment in the treatment arm, they were at 150. But it had no effect when you compare the control versus intervention arm on the progression of the aortic stenosis. So I think a good try, uh, but didn't work out. Therefore, you don't recommend statins just because someone has aortic sclerosis or, or uh, stenosis. Symptomatically, um, patients can either have no symptoms, which we'll talk about a little bit in the end. This can be a little bit of a challenging population to manage as far as when to intervene and refer them for surgery. But classically, they'll either have one of the triad of uh, dyspnea, syncope, or uh, chest pain. And here's the Nat classic sort of natural history um, from Braunwald of aortic stenosis. So you're looking at age on the x-axis and survival on the y. People are at risk for one reason or another and then develop sort of a pre-aortic stenotic lesion, the aortic sclerosis, and then develop some uh, hemodynamic consequences as far as mild to moderate AS. And once they've defined, uh, severe AS, once they've um, developed severe AS, the challenge is, is now when to intervene, because initially many people will be asymptomatic, but it's a very unpredictable um, timeline as far as when they'll develop symptoms, because once they develop the slightest of symptoms, their mortality uh, quickly uh, increases. So here's the challenge. You want to intervene here, but, but finding that point in an individual patient uh, can be tricky. The uh, guidelines uh, define aortic stenosis as the following, and it's really just important to remember what defines severe, and I think it's pretty easy. A jet velocity of greater than 4 meters per second, a mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, a valve area less than 1. So 4, 40, and 1. That's all you have to remember. Here is what's uh, done both in uh, the cath lab and the echo lab, and what you see is that velocity increases as blood passes through the stenosis. So the pressure drops, and that's what you see here. The, this is the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure. And as the pressure drops, the velocity increases. And this is what you see in the, in the echo lab. And you can calculate the gradient by 4v squared. Um, and here's uh, a similar cartoon showing that increase in velocity and drop in pressure across a stenosis. It's like putting your, your thumb over the end of a hose. Um, and here is the Doppler finding. So a normal flow across the aortic valve is about two meters per second. Severe, as you guys all now remember, is anything greater than four meters per second. So this patient had almost a six meter jet. So mean gradient of 92, so very severe. So when do we refer um, for a aortic valve intervention for aortic stenosis? In patients who have um, defined severe AS and they're symptomatic, it's a no-brainer. They go for a new valve. And if they're asymptomatic, it's a little bit more challenging. If their EF is dropped and they have severe AS, that would be a class one indication to intervene. Or if they're going for other surgery, bypass surgery, et cetera, and they're found to have severe AS, that would obviously be a reason to get it. The other, um, the other criteria for intervening on asymptomatics is a little trickier. There's those, if they have a jet velocity greater than five meters per second or a mean gradient of greater than 60 and they're low risk for surgery, it'd be reasonable to refer them. If they present asymptomatically and it's tough to quantify and you put them on a treadmill and clearly they don't have the exercise capacity or functional capacity that they should, so they have an abnormal exercise tolerance test, again, a reason to potentially intervene early. And if the disease is progressing um, at a rapid rate, the, the disease does not progress in a linear fashion. You know, people who have AS, can, can, it sort of plateaus, and then for one reason or another, something happens and it, and it progresses. So it's, it's interesting to sort of uh, follow these people over time where they'll suddenly act up. So if, if the, the VMAX has uh, changed greater than three meters per second in, within a year, then it would be reasonable to intervene at that time. 
Um, if they don't fit the criteria of severe and they have a velocity of less than four or mean gradients less than 40, they're a little bit tricky. If they're symptomatic and they have a low EF, then you need to determine whether or not it's truly aortic stenosis or something else, so you would do a dobutamine stress. If they augment and do truly have AS, it's reasonable. But if they don't augment and you're still convinced that their symptoms are from aortic stenosis, they still will do better with any aortic valve rather than just managing them uh, medically. Asymptomatic patients are um, relatively safe, and that was shown here. This is about 20, this study is about uh, 15 years old, but when you compare asymptomatic aortic stenosis patients to those um, without AS, there, there wasn't uh, over, over many years, they were relatively safe. And because we know, you know, sending someone for surgery is not a benign thing. I mean, there's inherent risks to that, so you want to make sure you're doing the right thing. Despite those patients um, being relatively safe, there were several, 11 in that study and 26 in the literature, who had asymptomatic AS but suffered uh, sudden cardiac death. So the challenge is when to intervene. Do you want a low-risk patient to wait for symptoms, or would you rather send them a low-risk asymptomatic patient for an AVR? And there are a couple things we can use uh, to help distinguish when is the right time to intervene. And one is this jet velocity. So here is um, a, it's not showing well here, but if, you're, if your jet velocity is four to five, you know, you're, you're kind of safe if you're asymptomatic. But once your jet velocity gets over five meters, your, your uh, survival curve is much steeper and you have much, many more events. So that's why the jet velocity of greater than, than five is a reasonable time to refer even an asymptomatic patient. The other thing is calcification. If you, if you have someone who's truly asymptomatic and they have uh, no or mild calcification on the aortic valve, they'll probably do okay. You can follow them. But to help sort of uh, distinguish if, if they do have a lot of calcium, uh, obviously the echo can help, but you can get a CT scan and, and really quantify the amount of calcification on the aortic leaflets. And if it's moderate or severe calcification, those people probably have a worse disease than they realize even though they're asymptomatic. So along with that high jet velocity, calcification would be another uh, sort of criteria you can use to tease out who may benefit from earlier intervention. Um, rather than later. And then, you know, the patient comes and tells you they're truly, they, they're, they're having no shortness of breath, no chest pain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then you really start talking to them and they're not doing anything. They've essentially modified their physical activity, probably because as a result of the disease. And it's reasonable um, to put them on a treadmill because if you tease out any sort of symptoms or decrease in functional capacity, those are patients here. So these are the truly asymptomatics when you look at a survival curve in severe AS patients. But when you tease out any sort of limiting symptom, even something minor, you know, just reducing their, their social activities, those people do, are in fact symptomatic and, and would warrant um, some sort of intervention. One of the challenges with treating and quantifying um, aortic stenosis disease is that it's entirely um, flow dependent. And so one of the, and this has been known for over 500 years. So one of the things that we deal with and you're going to deal with is these low flow patients. So in patients with aortic stenosis, a low flow state may occur, may occur with a reduced LVEF, and that's sort of the classic low flow, uh, low gradient patients. The challenging ones are these paradoxical low flows. So they have a low flow, low gradient, but a normal EF, and trying to tease that out and manage these patients um, is, is still sort of a, a moving target. But here's uh, sort of a, a chart that's nice to maybe um, refer to and, and use when you're sort of di uh, distinguishing the basic, the different hemodynamic scenarios of aortic stenosis. The classic that we don't have any problem with is right here. They, they're normal flow and they have a high gradient, they have AS. The other one that's not that challenging either is the low flow with a high gradient. If you have a high gradient, we know you have uh, aortic stenosis. The, most cha the, the challenging ones are over here. So you have normal flow, but a low gradient, but a patient who comes in with a reported you know, aortic stenosis of valve area of 0.8, a mean gradient of 28 millimeters of mercury with a normal EF and a, and a normal, um, and normal uh, stroke volumes, 
then you need to really think is aortic stenosis causing this patient's symptoms and maybe take a step back and look at other potential etiologies of this hemodynamic picture. When you have low flow, low gradient, um, you can have either, uh, you know, a preserved um, contractility, and these are the people you might, uh, if, particularly if their EF is dropped, you would give some dobutamine to and see if they truly have aortic stenosis. So here's uh, a, an example of someone who we would, you know, very easily refer for AS. Despite having low flow, low EF, they have a mean gradient of 46 millimeters of mercury. So that's the person that does well with surgery. When you have these paradoxical low flow, low, um, low flow, uh, low gradient patients, it's important to look at other potential etiologies. I mean, there's several, there's this whole spectrum of things that can lead to redu reduced forward stroke volume and reduced transvascular flow rate and therefore give this picture of paradoxical low flow, low gradient. So how do we approach these patients? First of all, is the patient truly um, symptomatic? Are they, are they, ha are they having um, decrease in activities? You can put them on a treadmill. One simple thing, and this was shown just a few months ago in Jack, a lot of these paradoxical low flow, low gradient patients have hypertension. So if you treated their hypertension adequately, they actually showed the gradients went down. And it makes sense when you, when you consider um, the physiology behind aortic stenosis. So make sure they're treated medically for sort of simple things. And if they are, you can, once they're optimized, you can reevaluate them. And then is, it, is the stenosis truly severe? With the low EF patients, you can give them dobutamine to sort of distinguish between those who have pseudoaortic stenosis. It's more of a ventricular issue than valvular. Or is it truly um, aortic stenosis? And again, um, as, we, as we saw, looking for calcification on the valves. If you can quantify significant calcification, then you probably do have some degree of severe aortic stenosis.